So, welcome to Virtual Church on the 3rd of October. Well, lovely to have you with us once more. We're going to be rounding off our series of things Jesus had to say about going to meet with God in the secret place and just by exploring a little bit more of what he meant by that secret place. So I'm going to read the next section along from Matthew 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus concludes his remarks on not doing your acts of righteousness or your prayers or your fasting before others, but doing, it, doing them by spending time with your Father who sees in secret. And he concludes by saying this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is in darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So the word I want to pick on, especially in the, in, in the middle of it, is your heart. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Uh, the scriptures have a lot to say about our hearts, but especially that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And amongst other things, because I think that's a very, very broad, very deep and very powerful concept, the idea of our heart. But I think it must be about who we are in our deepest self, our truest self. And it's also about where do our deepest motivations spring from? Because when somebody's got no more motivation, we say they've lost heart, don't we? It's an easy thing to do, is to lose heart. But in, in our current situation, when there don't seem to be any parameters and there doesn't seem to be much point in some of the things that we usually do. So the secret place then isn't just about going somewhere private, you know, don't do your acts of righteousness in public, don't stand up and trumpet them in the street corners. When you pray, go into your uh, room, close the door. It's actually the secret place is the secret place of our own heart. That person we most truly are, that deepest level of our motivations. And that's why Jesus connects our treasure and our heart. It's about our motivations too, the things that we treasure, the things that inspire us, the things that we want. And sadly, as we went through, we saw that Jesus perceived that many people around him wanted to have the look of being religious. They wanted to have a status that came from that. They wanted to be able to boost themselves up in their own eyes through doing it in the eyes of other people, make themselves out to be somebody when they had no real heart for it. And that was the difference for them between the public self and the heart, the innermost self. So they were more concerned about impressing other people or maybe impressing themselves. What, what a good job I must be doing with all this fasting, whatever it might be, than they were with impressing God. They didn't really have a heart that loved God. And therefore their treasure was in the wrong place. Their treasure was, oh, other people are going to think I'm all right. So maybe I am all right. Maybe I've proved it somehow through the works that I've done. Or even, well, I've shown myself to be so much better than other people. Sadly, it's a key part of human motivation has always been. And it's a very negative motivation is to be able to look down on other people. To feel better about ourselves but Jesus is saying this is not what God is looking for not what he is looking for so the treasure 
the heart, that's the secret place, the innermost chambers in our heart. The real us, the person that God sees and that God knows. And uh, this is where we've been talking about a place of integration where our lives can begin to be integrated because that real innermost truest self that we are doesn't need to hide in God's presence because God already sees what's there beforehand. God already knows what's going on inside us. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask him, Jesus has said in what we just read. So we have a place of profound integration where who we really are connects with the creator of the universe. The very heart of the universe touches our heart. And that's so liberating because we discover that that creative principle, that person, is love. And that is liberating. That sets us free and enables us to become whole people. But if we chase after other things, it just doesn't work. They don't meet the need that goes on in our secret place, in our innermost heart, to meet with the source of all life and of our own life. And sad to say it, but very often it's religion that becomes almost the enemy of God. Religion that says, I've done this and this and this, and I prayed for so many hours and fasted so many times and given this and that, becomes, instead of a means by which we know God, by which we express our love for God, by which God meets with us and sets us free, they become our shield and our defence against God. They keep him almost at a distance. Say, I've done enough to buy God off. I've appeased him. I've done my bit for him. And religion becomes actually hostile to God. And sadly, that's what happened with these other people we've talked about in the last three virtual church services who have received their reward in full. They didn't have a heart for God. Their heart, their, their reward, therefore, that wasn't to receive God's love. And all they wanted was to impress others and uh, set up themselves as holier than thou people. And so that's what they got, their full reward. But it wasn't the full reward that God wants to give us. So what do we do if we look in our hearts and find so much apathy and indifference? And this is actually a big problem for conscientious Christians because we want to look in and ask ourselves, am I doing it right? Am I, am I worthy? Have I obeyed God to the full? Well, Jesus then talks about the eye. So we're still with the anatomy here. Uh, the eye of the body. Uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. And this tells us what we look at. So if we feel that our hearts aren't really up to it, you know, that maybe our heart fully isn't in it, that, that worship is leaving us cold or perhaps we're getting tired, well, Jesus then talks about the eye. Because what we look at that then illuminates our heart. The eye is the lamp of the body. If our eyes are good, well, that actually means, are we looking at the light? Then our whole body will be full of light. If our eyes are good, we're looking at the light, and the light can fill us through and through. And it's having bad eyes, eye, bad eyes that look to some other light, that look to how impressive a figure we might be able to cut, or uh, what status we can achieve in the eyes of others. Uh, well, then we're full of darkness. Jesus is still commenting, did you see, on what he said before about different ways of doing religion, some of them not helpful, some of them toxic as far as poisoning the inner life of our heart is concerned. So, so what we can do if our heart needs more exercise, if our heart is growing faint and weary, just check what we're looking at. Make sure we take a bit of time to reflect on the love of God. Do some worship. Think of things to thank God for and praise God for. And that will change our outlook. Outlook, the eye of the body, 
into something as much more positive. Look at the scriptures and try to absorb the things that God promises to us and says about himself and about his salvation given to us in Jesus. So where are we looking? That's the key question there. And uh, finally, no one can serve two masters and he'll hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. Although he ends by saying you cannot serve both God and money, the same applies, doesn't it, to our three characters before who were trying to achieve honour in the eyes of the others by blowing the trumpet when they gave, by making loud and a theologically perfect, full of long words, prayers, or by um, fasting and making sure everybody knew uh, that they were uh, doing it in this way. We cannot serve God and those other things. That's again about our deepest motivation. So uh, let's learn through what we look at, through looking to God and his mercy and his grace. Uh, not to get into idolatry, whether it's the idolatry of money or status or power or reputation or honour in the eyes of others. These are idols. They destroy us in the end. Let's make sure that we serve our master as best we can. So we'll be listening to a hymn in a moment, which uh, is based on the old hymn, Take My Life, Let It Be. And um, this sounds hard. I really got to love God with my whole heart, with everything I've got. Isn't God being too demanding? But it's actually the way to true freedom, true peace, and true fulfillment. Let us pray. Your eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Dear Lord, help us to look to you with eyes full of love and adoration, just as you look upon us with eyes full of love and compassion. Please, Lord, you already know the secrets of our innermost hearts. Touch our lives afresh and help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Um, looking forward to Sunday church tomorrow for those who are able to come. Don't feel under any pressure until you're confident that it's okay for you. You know your situation um, and uh, don't come before you're ready. Um, but otherwise, see you at the next virtual church on Tuesday. God bless you. Bye-bye now.